Thank you, Mark, for inviting me to do this and the Academic Health Science Centre as well for supporting our work. Uh, I always follow Johan's talks uh, with a little bit of trepidation. It's a huge amount of work and a huge amount of change and benefit to patient care uh, that has come out of Johan's group. Uh, and it's amazing work. I'm very, very, very nervous to follow such uh, greatness. Um, so I'm going to talk about screening and early diagnosis. And one of the things that patients, lay public often ask is, why do we not have a screening program for prostate cancer? And we don't because there is still concern that some of the harms of diagnosing cancer early through biopsies and over treating cancer that shouldn't be treated at all, probably shouldn't be found, um, doesn't offset the benefit in terms of improving survival. Uh, and it's a common issue in all screening programs for, for cancer. Uh, and in prostate cancer is particularly uh, controversial. So my conflicts are here. Uh, the main conflict is I am a urologist um, and I'm eternally grateful to all of our supporters and funders for supporting this. Uh, and obviously that has some influence in what I say uh, inevitably. So when you consider a screening program, you have to uh, look at a number of criteria um, the Wilson and Younger criteria, which were set a few decades back, adopted by the World Health Organization. Uh, and these are really critical. And this is how regulatory bodies, National Screening Committee, the US Preventative Services Task Force, which is the equivalent of our National Screening Committee, make decisions about whether we should screen for disease, not just prostate cancer or cancers generally. So first of all, the disease has to be important and prostate cancer uh, is important. Thousands of men die of the disease every year. We do now understand that when we diagnose it in its early form, we understand how it progresses. We still need to understand a lot more, but we do have a general understanding that most prostate cancers are what we call indolent. They sit there, they don't do anything, but some cancers, if left to their own devices, will progress. And we want to find the latter, but we don't want to find the first group of men. Because the first group of men, those indolent cancers that just sit in the prostate, they occur in a third of the male population above the age of 50. And if we start finding and treating those cancers, then we're going to end up causing a lot of harm. And that's at the crux of the whole screening debate. We do have strategies to find th those cancers early. So I think we've met those three criteria. The disease is important. 12, over 12,000 men die of the disease every year. And our goal is to find the, what we call the index lesion. That tumor that if left to its own devices would progress would metastasize and would cause a shortening of life or a serious deleterious effect on quality of life as a result of pain, bleeding, um, and all of those things that come from advanced disease. In the past, and only in the recent past, um, we didn't really have tests that were suitable for finding disease in an accurate manner. There's a blood test called PSA, which if elevated in the past, and even now to um, probably thousands, tens of thousands of men in the US still have this pathway where if their PSA is high, they have a random biopsy through the back passage in the hope that you would hit the cancer. And it's random, it's not accurate. It's just as much missed important cancers as found unimportant cancers. And because it was a back passage biopsy, it was harmful because it caused infection. We do now have better tests. We have still the PSA, we have an MRI, which is a scan to look at the prostate, and we have targeted ways of guiding the biopsy to the right place through the skin rather than through the back passage. So better accuracy, fewer harms. And so this is an MRI scan uh, of a gentleman with an elevated PSA. This is his prostate here. 
The water passage is somewhere here. This is the back passage. And the area that's outlined in red is the suspicious area. Now, if you did a back pass passage biopsy, you'd probably miss that tumor. And these sorts of tumors would then progress and you'd find them at a much more advanced stage. With an MRI scan now, I know that this is where the suspicious area is. I can target that lesion. And this has really transformed the way the, the world has looked at prostate cancer diagnosis. And that research was led from the UK. We delivered that change. And importantly, it also means for great groups like Johan, um, we can give them tissue that is much better representative of the tumor rather than cause, catching a glancing blow. So we can get much better research tools from this research tissue for from this uh, approach in changing diagnosis. And in West London, we we pioneered this approach um, uh, in 2017 uh, when I came over to Imperial, and about 6,000 men have been through this pathway. And it means that we biopsy fewer men because those men who don't have a, a lesion on the MRI avoid a biopsy because their chance of having life-threatening cancer is extremely low. And almost all of the cancers we diagnose are cancers that we would want to treat at some point after diagnosis. There's no rush in many of these men, but most we would want to treat. And our sepsis rate, so life-threatening infection as a result of a diagnostic test, has gone down to about 0.1%. And in London, it was almost as high as 2 to 4% which if you multiply that out across a million biopsies in Europe and a million biopsies in the US, that's a high number of men having life-threatening sepsis. So that has almost plummeted close to zero. Screening programs need to continuously look for cancers. That's what, cancers just don't happen at the age of 50 and then if you're negative, that's it. Uh, and we've had various studies, which I'll go through, which have provided conflicting evidence as to whether screening with PSA tests work or not. Uh, and so this is the first. Um, this is the UK study. Uh, it's called CAP, led by Freddie Hamdi in Oxford and Richard Martin in Bristol and Jenny Donovan. And what they showed is that if you do a one-off PSA test, without repeating it afterwards, there is no improvement in terms of survival from a prostate cancer perspective compared to men who don't have a one-off PSA test. This was criticized because it didn't repeat the PSA test every two years, but it was, it's nonetheless a negative study and it's an issue that we have to deal with because regulatory bodies look at this and say, well, screening doesn't make a difference. In the US, they ran the PLCO trial, um, and this also showed that there was no improvement in mortality if you regularly screened, and they did regular PSA tests. The problem is that this randomized controlled trial had huge amounts of PSA testing in those men who were in the control group, the comparator group, who were supposed to just carry on merrily on their way uh, and just continue with life without worrying about screening for prostate cancer, because that was the only way we could see if a systematic programmatic approach to screening worked. The problem is the minute you alert men that uh, screening is an issue, prostate cancer is an issue, they go off and have a PSA test and any effect that we might have seen in terms of improvement in mortality is diluted by the fact that the comparator group, over 50%, and some estimates uh, have come out showing it's almost 90%, had regular PSA tests. So there was no difference, but it might be because the two groups were so similar. Uh, and this is a huge waste of resource and waste of money because the control group was not controlled. And then this is the study, the European screening trial, which most people hang on to when they are pushing for screening because this did show an improvement in survival when you regularly screened every two years 
and uh, and did a biopsy, a random biopsy. There was no MRI in this study, uh, and then treated on that basis. But the problem is that this study also showed that we would have to screen hundreds of men and diagnose dozens of men in order to save the life or extend the life of one man. So a lot of testing, a lot of harms from that testing, a lot of anxiety and healthcare burden, and a lot of these men who had low risk disease ended up having radical prostatectomy or radiotherapy, which I'll come on to, carried heart. And so we need treatments that are beneficial in terms of cancer control, but also have fewer harms of treatment. And the problem is when we diagnose prostate cancer, uh, a lot of physicians choose to treat or advise treatment, and a lot of men get very anxious and also choose to treat, uh, to have treatment, uh, which can be very harmful in terms of quality of life. We are now better at identifying those men that are unlikely to require treatment. So we can do active surveillance and monitor those men very safely without compromising their life expectancy. So in the UK, when we find low risk disease, which is less common now because of MRI scans and targeted biopsies, but when we do find low risk disease, the vast majority uh, go on to, this is incorrect, sorry, it should be 95% of men with low risk prostate cancer go on to active surveillance in the UK. So 95% go on to active surveillance in the UK. But even the medium risk cancers, they may have one tiny little area which does need to be treated. It affects maybe five to 10% of their prostate, but we're treating too many of those men radically. And what I mean by radical is surgery that removes the entire prostate or radiotherapy that irradiates the whole prostate. The problem with that is it's very effective, those approaches, but the back passage, as you can see, is very close. So radiation can sometimes give you back passage symptoms. The nerves that supply erections are on the surface of the prostate and you can get erection problems. The water passage and the sphincter muscle that stops you from leaking is inside the prostate and so side effects can be caused. And there is an alternative approach which can target, provided we're confident that that is the only main area of tumor, that can target that area of cancer, uh, focal therapy. And again, this is an area we have uh, pioneered in the UK and led uh, and continue to lead on. Um, because you do an MRI scan, you find this lesion, and you, you then remove the whole prostate. It just doesn't make sense. And this is why it doesn't make sense, because the urinary issues, the leakage risk from these whole gland treatments, the erection problems, back passage problems can be quite significant. And so significant that some men get put off from having treatment and until it's too late. Uh, some men don't go for testing because they're so worried that they may end up having these treatments. So it has an impact on acceptance of screening. And you get a five to tenfold lower risk of urinary and sexual dysfunction when you treat. In selected men, and we think about one third of men newly diagnosed with localized prostate cancer can have focal therapy. Only about one to one and a half thousand men every year are having it there should be about 10,000 men who are eligible for it. At the moment, they're not being offered it because of limitations or um, professional uh, issues. And then lastly, if you want screening, it has to be cost-effective. This is a public health uh, issue. Uh, every individual man is important. Every individual man that Johan saves and helps with his research uh, and wonderful work in developing new drugs is important. And we're not trying to downplay that, but when you're looking at a public health issue like screening, you have to look at costs. And if we want to bring in screening, then 
this is the sort of capacity we would need in just getting MRI scans. Huge, huge increase in capital, radiographers, radiologists, even with artificial intelligence tools, if they are proven to work, more urologists, more pathologists, more clinical nurse specialists. It would place the NHS on its knees. And so we do need evidence that it is also cost effective for the UK, not the NHS, for the UK to deliver a screening program because we need to look at wider societal context, early return to work, people living longer, contributing to society. So we've been very fortunate, uh, Prostate Cancer UK and the National Institute of Health Research, as well as support from Movember, have uh, awarded a 42 million pound uh, grant to deliver a new screening trial. And I'm very grateful to all of our um, collaborators mentioned here uh, for this. Um, and we're going to deliver a new study that will deal with all of those issues, hopefully, that we have seen in those three previous trials that I summarized. And we're going to have to provide robust evidence that a new screening program can be delivered, that men will accept it, they will agree to come and have a screening uh, test, that that screening program will reduce the harms that we're used to seeing from PSA testing, whilst retaining the benefit of mortality improvements. This will be set out in three stages. Initially, we'll test out a number of different strategies. We'll work together to collect tissue for research, bloods and urine for research, and then we'll deliver one strategy that we think will be really key and take that into the long term over a minimum 10 year worth of follow up to see if we can see that same mortality benefit. We'll recruit as widely as possible, uh, but we will have some selection criteria as outlined here. And one of the key things we think is doing an MRI scan earlier, a prostogram akin to a mammogram is going to be absolutely key. So we're going to test out different approaches where we use a prostogram MRI either very early, regardless of the PSA test or at various thresholds and working with Johan's colleague in ICR, my colleague in ICR, Ros, Professor Ros Eels, we will also look at polygenic risk scoring. And what we're going to do is try and weave together what we know is the cancer control and survival benefit of screening with all of those innovations that Professor De Bono has outlined, all of those benefits in improving survival from late stage disease and show that we can improve cancer control or prostate cancer, improve mortality, but reduce all of those harms that have been holding back the regulatory bodies. And we hope that transform will do that. Thank you very much.